Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Ra Rachel Riley. Rachel is a co-founder and head of GRC ESG at Ansarada, and she is uh, working on uh, many topics, specifically uh, GRC and uh, operational resilience. And today uh, we will try to introduce you to our partner uh, on Sarada, which we working with for, for many months. And Rachel was one of the four partners, uh, founders of at Ansarada, and now she works uh, with a global team uh, where day to day she ensures the execution of strategy and drives the company towards their vision. So Rachel, welcome to our risk management show podcast today. Thank you, Boris. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure as well. I believe that uh, we will have a very thoughtful conversation on the topic of operational resilience because many people in the risk uh, area and compliance uh, professionals are very interested in this. And this uh, actually um, became a very um, topic that uh, many people had to uh, take a, a care of. But before that, could you tell us a short story about your uh, career path, what, you, what brought you to where you are right now and what you guys at, at Ansarada are up to these days? Yep, sure. Um, I guess I'll start with sort of finishing university. So I did a uh, Bachelor of Business and majored in accounting at university. My father used to own a small business and I got interested in accounting doing his uh, books on those big paper ledgers that used to exist. Um, so that's where I started. And then I left uni and I went into um, one of the big four KPMG. Um, so I was working... Uh, predominantly in assurance, the audit division of KPMG. Um, I actually spent probably half of my KPMG life out at Qantas, um, so Australia's national um, carrier, um, doing a lot of work there. And so that was a bit of audit, but obviously Qantas was also doing a lot of transactions and um, dipped my toe in their treasury uh, audits. That Qantas had uh, the biggest corporate treasury in Australia, so that was very interesting for me. Um, and then through the work that I was doing at KPMG, I ended up uh, doing work, uh, EBIT earnout transaction for a uh, company back then called Hotel Club. Some of the um, listeners might be familiar with a company that spun out of there called Hotels Combined. Um, and, and the founder of that uh, entity, which is an interesting side fact, went on to found Menulog. Um, and achieved one of the biggest uh, corporate valuations and 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 buyouts that that um, from a tech company uh, has seen in quite a while. So it was while I was working on that transaction um, that I met Andrew, who is the A N in Ansarada. So the name Ansarada comes from the first two letters of the four founders: oh. Andrew, Sam, Rachel, oh. myself, and. And Daphne, so that's where Ansarada um, comes from. Um, so anyway, I met Andrew there, and um, he they were working on a um, obviously ever earn out better M and A um, style transaction and using a data room. Um, and back then, you know, there were a couple of American companies, um, Intralinx and uh, Merrill. That was back then Merrill Data Site who had um, data room companies, but back then also people were still using physical data room. So, you know, data room, um, a, as most of the um, listeners would understand, is just a place where, you know, you, you go in and perform due diligence. Um, mm -hmm. So able to look at the various uh, uh, books of the entity, uh, you know, that you might be acquiring in an M&A transaction. So anyway, we... Um, and I did work in some data rooms while I was at um, KPMG. And so we started investigating, you know, really what could be possible with a data room from a tech perspective. Um, and so Andrew, uh, Sam, myself and Daphne, the four founders, we started quietly working away on the possibility of a tech business there. Um, and, you know, fast forward, you know, we, we work behind the scenes basically interviewing and we work this way actually continuing today with Ansarada, but we really worked with, they weren't our customers then, but they are now and just went and asked them what, you know, what is their biggest problems and what solutions do they see? And we started crafting out that uh, first data room product and we got our first sales 
Um, you know, we've been uh, as a, a lot of founders and, you know, all business journeys. We started in a garage and, you know, went on a lot of journeys up and down a lot of rolling hills um, <laughs> and some, you know, more felt like cliffs along the way. But now we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We've been around for uh, close to 18 years now. Wow. Um, and so primarily we started with the data room or deal room product. Um, mm -hmm. But really, you know, we've always been very vision led. And so back then it was about, um, you know, making life easier for deal makers. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, as you, you, you know, and our listeners um, probably know, when you're going through a transaction like that, it's very high stakes, um, you know, and there's a lot that, you know, can be impacted. Um, and really, you know, we knew from, you know, we've run over 30,000 transactions now. It takes on average for around around six months for a business just to get ready to present themselves to the third, their, a third party because they want to be on top of all their operation or risks and they want to be on top of their opportunities to put their best foot forward in what could be, you know, their most critical transaction, M&A and IPO, raising funds, et cetera. Um, and so if you if you look at that six months and call that a process of getting readiness, in today's mm -hmm. age, you can't afford six months, you know. If someone comes knocking on your door and says, are you compliant, you can't say, I'll just go and check, I'll come back in six mm -hmm. months, especially with the fast pace of today. So we we wanted to turn readiness from a process into a state. And to do that, we started looking at um, governance, risk and compliance software and what that does in terms of, you know, bringing those risks and controls and opportunities to the forefront. So we invested into a uh, governance risk compliance company. Um, and so my, you know, role today through that journey is I, you know, have uh, very little involvement now in the deal side of Ansarada um, and I run our, um, GRC um, mm -hmm. and our evolving ESG uh, solutions. So, yeah, a bit of a... Um, a, a, a bit of a long one, but a very short uh, story um, in terms of our journey and where we sit today. Fantastic! Yeah, I see. Mostly, some some of the companies come uh, directly from uh, GRC world, and you came from uh, uh, M and emerging uh, positions, uh, accounting world to uh, GRC. So it's a unique, uh, unique opportunity for you as a kind of uh, young. Uh, <laughs> Young company in this area to uh, attract uh, new customers and new uh, users, right? So yes, absolutely. Let, yeah. Let's discuss uh, your uh, you and Sarada issued the operational uh, resilience outlook report uh, for for this year, and I believe that many members of our community had chance uh, and opportunity to download it uh, via our emails and the blog post. Uh, uh, this report. So uh, let's discuss some uh, findings that you 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 published on this report. But before that, can you uh, describe uh, why is operational resilience becoming uh, such a critical priority of organization today? Because in the past we saw about business continuity, kind of other 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 um, subjects that not related to resilience, and now we uh, operational resilience is on top of uh, everyone's uh, uh, mind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think like business continuity, you know, is probably the term that most people are familiar with and having their BCP plans, etc. And I think what's happening is, you know, that BCP is arguably about resilience, you know, ensuring that where something happens in the business that, you know, you have processes and procedures to help recover from that. Um, but BCP is traditionally and still, you know, is the case, but a shifting case managed, you know, typically by IT um, or sitting back, you know, in a, a department of risk if it's a bigger entity and it's not integrated into the business. So that brings its own problems because people see it as a side, you know, as something that should be done. Um, and a side thing, but inevitably, you know, people, when an event happens, they don't know really what to do um, or where to go or where to start. So BCP is meant to help with that, but there's an increasing shift to resilience, you know, driven primarily from, you know, the changing nature 
um, and the the fast paced business world and economic world that we live in. So we live in you know an increasingly disruptive world, and there's a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, you know, climate uncertainty, that brings uncertainty to businesses and consumers alike, which then have impacts right through the business world. Um, and obviously, you know, there's uh, opportunities within that, that both, you know, the, there's people who play to the good side of those opportunities and the bad side of those opportunities. So one of those is obviously the increasing threat of cyber and the impact that cyber um, is having an increasing impact. And then, you know, on top of that, businesses are becoming more and more dependent to third parties and, you know, their parties, third and fourth parties um, as they operate. So it's becoming an increasingly complex and, you know, technology-driven world, and that is increasing uh, the level of disruption and the risk of disruption that can happen and does happen within a business and, therefore, um, if businesses are not resilient to that, then they have to move, you know, um, they have to move on that. And if not, they uh, will be disrupted and they won't be able to recover or recover as quickly or in the same way. Mm -hmm. So uh, based on your uh, research and uh, the findings, uh, how can companies better prepare for disruptions and build a, a culture of uh, resilience? Yeah. I think the, there's many things that a company can do, which I could touch on, but I, the one I like the best is, you know, we've all heard that quote about, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And it is when, you know, things become necessity that really people start acting and they must act and a solution has to be found. Um, and so I think one of the strongest points, you know, to that question is to actually, you know, go out and test and actually scenario test how your business would stand up. And I believe that, you know, is the the profound way in which a business is going to actually realise and have the biggest shock to its culture in terms of stemming with the board about how unprepared they probably are across certain events. Um, so I think that's the the number one thing that would have the impact, but there's challenges to do that because it doesn't get priority. Um, and so one of the, the, you know, key things that a business can do is actually start to educate the board, which has ramifications um, in terms of the culture and how the business looks at the necessity of risk and resilience management. Um, so I think it starts there and I think, you know, the the boards, um, you know, the, the boards are just humans, you know, who come together and they have to deal with very complex things that not everyone's going to understand, such as cyber. Um, but I think what resilience does and where um, companies can start is start by looking at what are their critical processes um, that they need to deliver to customers and they need the, the business to stay alive with. And, you know, start to look at that and present it back to the board um, in a risk capacity in terms of if this was interrupted, like what are our processes, what are our key resources that help those processes uh, uh, get performed and start really bringing to life for the board and management um, the impact that could arise um, and the likelihood of that impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's discuss uh, about the uh, readiness and maturity of uh, this uh, 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 process and what you see. So what are the biggest uh, challenges uh, organizations face when implementing a formal uh, resilience framework? Because I think uh, your company also provides a framework and other companies provide. But what are the main challenges when they decide, company decide to do, to actually implement a resilience framework? Yeah, yeah. So I think first, like what one of the outcomes from our survey was, you know, 50% of respondents don't even have a common or don't know if they have a common definition of operational resilience or a common framework in place. So they don't even know if one exists yet. So obviously, you know, that that indicates that even if one exists, then it's existing in silo. Um, and that is also critical and came across in our survey around, you know, 61% of respondents had no dedicated team. So some of those bigger challenges are, you know, what I touched on at the start, getting buy-in from the top. 
Um, you know, one of the things coming out in the survey was budget constraints that impact that. That can be affected if you get buy-in from the top, um, but also the challenges around, you know, operating in silo, um, not having it integrated um, within the business. And so it needs to be owned. There needs to be an owner um and and you know the the respondents indicate they don't really have dedicated team and ownership across resilience and if you don't have that it's not going to get done properly um so it does need an owner but it needs a integrated team across the business who's operating throughout the business and involving stakeholders um in the analysis and you know the 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 preparation of that framework mm -hmm. So what do you see? How they uh, can actually companies address this lack of dedicated resources and ensure a centralized uh, oversight of uh, resilience effort? Yeah, I think, um, you know, aside from going and, you know, looking at the cultural impact and the buy-in uh, from the board, um, I think that's where you need to start um, in essence. And then I think... Where what we've seen companies do that has worked quite well is instead of trying to, you know, uh, uh, eat the elephant, as they say, um, you know, you do it one bite at a time, is to actually just go and look at one uh, process that is critical to your business um, or critical to the delivery uh, to your consumer base and then have a look at the resources and the processes. You know, when I say resources, I mean what third parties are involved um, in that process to keep that process running? What third-party systems are you using? What people are supporting those processes? Um, and do a risk assessment against that in terms of uh, disruption um, and, and knowledge. A lot of people don't know, um, you know, are there third parties, you know, how equipped are their third parties in dealing with a disruptive event um, or when they can be susceptible to a disruptive event. And I think bringing, you know, bringing those, like starting in that place and bringing that back to the organisation, you know, your risk committee, especially um, management and just heightening the awareness of the risk that is currently, you know, in play in the business um, and obviously outlining the consequences of what would happen if that was disrupted um, and you don't have to go too deep. I think people start to overthink, but I think, you know, to get that impact, it's about sort of giving at least a holistic view and an estimate on, you know, what would happen if this was disrupted and based on what we know, how long would it take us to recover? And that's probably not going to look good based on the stats that we see, you know, only 10% of businesses, you know, BCG ran a survey and only 10% are ready. Um, to be able to recover and thrive through a disruption. Um, so it's unlikely your business sits there and, and I think bringing a bit of that visibility with data um, can help uh, overcome some of those challenges uh, such as the the culture and the budget challenges that I spoke of. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's discuss uh, about a regulatory environment because uh, we see that companies uh, should... Uh, should adapt to the increasingly complex and uh, ever-changing regulatory landscape, and this uh, happens all uh, through the uh, through the uh, all countries. So, how do you see this uh, regulatory landscape, and how it doesn't uh, in, in influence uh, this uh, uh, resilience uh, projects? Yeah, I think it's having a huge, you know, favorable impact. Um, and significantly increasing the the you know the 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 view um, and the work uh, that's involved and helping in terms of the uh, you know necessity angle because now you have to do it because it's regulated. Um, but I think it will have a significant impact on businesses and you know an uplift from that ten percent that I spoke of in terms of being able to to have that. So. You know, there's very. I would say uh, it's in its infancy. Um, you know, I think PS twenty one three, which is the operational resilience standard in the UK, probably led the way. Um, I really love what they're doing and what they said, and you know that they they really see it as a new way to look at risk management, and I firmly believe that. I think the um, I think risk registers, and you know, they they obviously have their place. Um, but I think operational resilience is what's needed in this day and age 
um, in terms of the disruption that we do have and fast uh, pace that we're moving against to do that. So do, I think they're doing great things and shifting businesses across. Um, APRA um, down in Australia is, is is the Operational Risk Regulation, CPS 230, um, and they, you know, they came out and said they were, you know, starkly worried about some of their other uh, prudential regulations and standards and the movements from business, especially around cyber resilience. Um, and that and that's part of the reason why they led to the operational risk regulation and they're pushing that in a big way. So both, you know, the FCA and, and APRA have really led the way on that. Um, but in saying that businesses are still playing catch up uh, to that regulation, they are getting their house in order because they know that they're going to come and get audited. Um, there's fines in place, which I think, are, which I think are good things. Uh, and, and we've seen some of those fines present themselves um, in the FCA. So yeah, overall, a huge, huge role uh, um, and a great role in, in, you know, really putting I guess a kick up a kick up the bum to some organizations to actually do something that they should arguably be doing already. But I like the way that they've done it, which is uh that inside out approach rather than, you know, and looking at risk from an outside in approach. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So Let's discuss about uh, mitigating uh, uh, risk and especially emerging operational risks such as uh, uh, AI and uh, climate, climate change. And what do you see uh, happening in the market uh, and how can organizations overcome, uh, overcome this uh, new uh, kind of uh, risk and actually mitigate them? Yeah, um, I think the, 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 the foundations of operational risk um, in terms of that holistic, integrated way and approach to governance and risk needs to absolutely um, take place. Um, so I think getting that board buying is critical to being able to get budget buy-in um, without the, you know, the necessity that the board sees. So coming in and taking a firm risk approach, um, doing a, a cost-benefit analysis and the impact um, that could eventuate um, and, and, you know, I think, I think in the past it's been, uh, you know, it's unlikely to happen to us. And I think, um, what, you know, head of risk and CROs and compliance officers have today is a wealth of information, um, that they can take and bring in terms of data, you know, 91% of businesses have experienced a disruptive event in the last two years, and that's outside of the pandemic, um, so it is significant and it's not a matter of, um, you know, if you will be disrupted, it's when. So the likelihood, you know, if we're talking traditional risk view on a matrix is extremely high and the impact is extremely high. So bringing that cost benefit a, a, a approach can help overcome some of those um, challenges um, and then use it, utilising tools to be able to do that to get an integrated approach. Um, and especially across cyber, you know, being able to establish and look at really your third and fourth parties, we're seeing an increasing impact from, uh, you know, especially cyber events where they're attacking third parties and then obviously companies are being impacted. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've just uh, spoken with another guy on uh, an interview about, about this uh, uh, authentication and authorization problem and how a big company such as uh, I think it was an MGM uh, ep episode uh, incident in America uh, where a lot of uh, damage was uh, was done because of uh, possibility of uh, uh, kind of fraudsters uh, in, in, in come to actually the database of the company and, and pretend to be an employee so they can, can uh, disrupt all the services. Uh, Rachel, I would like to ask you a personal point of view. What is the major misconception uh, in the operational uh, resilience space that you kind of strongly disagree with? Um, I think the major misconception that that I, I hear time and time again, which I completely disagree with, is that 
it's you know a risk a traditional like pe people look at it from a traditional risk approach so it's about you know having those risks known and then having controls against those risks um and you know i just completely disagree with that because i think the board you know and also i think there's a hesitancy um certainly that we've seen in a lot of organizations that we work with where they they feel like it's just a regulatory thing and they have to manage it internally themselves and they're not bringing that visibility to the board so uh, you know the best example of that is when people just think of operational resilience as um what i call like a silo disruptive view where the board you know i'm using the board deliberately because obviously the you know, as the top goes, so does the rest of the business. But, you know, the board currently, you know, I would argue most boards don't look at it properly because I think the boards sit there and currently go, are we okay on cyber? You know, are we okay on privacy? What are we doing on AI? Are we okay on that? Um, and I think that is like a traditional approach with a risk register where you list out your risks and likelihood and impact and controls, et cetera. That has its place. But that it's it's not right and it's not what operational resilience is looking for what operational resilience is looking for is starting with the business first which is something you know from the board down everyone can understand so what are our most important business services or critical processes to keep the lights on for consumers you know for banks to be able to get you know for customers to be able to get their money out or or make deposits you know what are the most critical processes across our operations for us to be able to get the lights on now that is without even thinking about what could hit that it's just having you know almost a journey flow of you know and a map of what your processes are and who supports those processes and geographical locations etc to get those services out and once you have that then you can start to look at you know what kind of impact which obviously is what the regulation starts to look at what is our impact tolerance to those processes how long could we be down for before it causes intolerable harm to our consumers, you know, in, you know, it could be banking process. How long is that, you know, and how do we look at that for a business? And then you have the ability to go and test and scenario test those processes. So that, that ability is unattainable when you're looking at it in a, you know, a, a outside in view or a, through a traditional risk register, because if you think about it, you know, okay, there's a cyber, you know, there's some sort of cyber event that impacts, um, you know, AWS um, somehow, and there's so much dependency on that. By having that view that I was talking about, a business can go, okay, where, what processes are dependent on AWS and what is our most critical process according to that impact tolerance? Okay, getting payments out to this particular customer group is our most impactful process. So that's where we have to go first. You know, the same thing applies if you're just looking at um, location, you know, um, a, a weather event, you know, in Australia could be bushfire, you know, could could be a flood, et cetera. What happens if that location gets taken down? So that inside out and the true approach to operational resilience gives you you know, not just that full picture, but where to go first in the event of a disruption and enables, you know, that that testing to occur. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So if we summarize our interview for someone who, who is listening to it and would like to walk away with one or two uh, major takeaways, wh what would it be? Uh, my takeaway would be you probably a further behind than what you think in terms of your ability um, a, a for the business to withstand a disruption. Um, my takeaway would be that you should absolutely go and have a look and start, if you haven't already, at one of your processes or your critical resources through the business and start asking questions about whether that has been tested um, for a disruptive event. And if not, you should um, do that testing um, I would also advise that if you're testing through, you know, typically one of the most common ones that probably people will start with is a cyber test, you should involve the board in that. Um, I think running a simulation actually, you know, is that back to that first quote I said, you know, a, 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 
the, the the mother of invention is necessity and I think the board you know and key players being involved in that it actually when you run a proper simulation you know your heart gets racing and you can see that actually if this happened I don't want this to happen because it's an impact to the business and to to, to people's credibility and reputation and potential you know, fines. And I think starting with that platform can get you going in terms of what you need to do. Um, and I would also go in, you know, with with facts and and some of those scary things that that can um and likely will happen um if you if you don't address this. And I think going into, you know, management, the CEO, the board with that uh can help impact some of the uh, you know some of the key challenges that came out through our survey in terms of funding and, and getting a team together and a dedicated resource mm -hmm. all right rachel fantastic that's where all my questions perhaps if i if i forgot something that you would like to uh to uh, uh, address to our audience please go ahead maybe you can tell, take a, a few words about uh Say some few few words about Ansarada and how it helps uh, uh, our, our members uh, to take steps yeah. to to improve their uh, resilience. Absolutely, thanks, Boris. It would be remiss of me not to mention the Ansarada. So we've we've actually built. You know, I think we we being honest with with everyone. We, you know, like many other players in the industry, looked at operational resilience and went, oh, okay, yep, we can sort of manage that through the GRC software that we do have because it is interconnected um, and it does look at risks and controls and it does allow these events and this integration and reporting to come. But we quickly realised, actually, this is a different view that's needed. So Ansarada has built a operational re um, resilience platform um, you know, utilising um, regulation and what's required in regulation um, and really for purpose um, to ensure that, you know, obviously you are compliant with that regulation um, in terms of everything that you need to do, but ultimately, obviously, to ensure that that picture of your most critical business processes, services and resources and testing um, so, so in our product, we have a library, pre-built library that you can utilize to get started. Um, we have a pre-built library of scenario testing and test plans that you can use across the business um, to bring this to life. You know, it's not easy to do, um, and we're here to make it a bit more easier and bring a bit of order to the chaos that is out there. Um, so, please, yeah, reach out. Um, you know, get it, get it. Um, have a look. Um, at Ansarada and, and obviously we're happy to provide a demonstration and talk further and get you um, started um, with technology that's going to help you through this process. Yeah, uh, great. Actually, we have also, if you uh, members uh, look on our at site, a global risk community, we have a lot of blogs and posts from Ansarada and um, we also have uh, your company page where uh, members can uh, uh, kind of sign up to a demo session, I believe. And this is also, if you would like to, um, members would like to go uh, to this route. And uh, of course, uh, we are welcome and uh, welcome on Sarada to be our partners. We are doing a lot of uh, content uh, um, uh, kind of uh, discovery with you guys. And I wish you uh, in Ansarada a great success in uh, uh, achieving uh, your goals in uh, GRC SG market. Thank you so much, Boris. It's great uh, to partner with the global risk community, and um, yeah, we're getting we're getting a lot of um, you know content out there, but we're also getting a lot of um, uh, 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 in, in questions back. Um, an interest back from your community. So, yeah, we really value your insights and what you're providing um, in the community and uh, everyone's benefiting from that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.